Imagine, Mr. Speaker, being subjected to laws, policies, and hiring practices that label you as different, as less than. Imagine having to fight for the basic rights that your peers enjoy over and over again. And imagine being criminalized for who you are. This is the truth for many of the Canadians present in the gallery today, and many more listening across the country. This is the devastating story of people who were branded criminals by the government, people who lost their livelihoods and, in some cases, their lives. And these aren't distant practices of governments long forgotten. These happened systematically in Canada with a timeline more recent than any of us would like to admit. Mr. Speaker, today we acknowledge an often overlooked part of Canada's history. Today, we finally talk about Canada's role in the systemic oppression, criminalization and violence against the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer and two-spirit communities. And it is my hope that in talking about these injustices, in vowing to never repeat them, and acting to right these wrongs, we can begin to heal. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, today we acknowledge an often overlooked part of Canada's history. Today, we finally talk about Canada's role in the systemic oppression, criminalization, and violence against the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and two-spirit communities. It is my hope that in talking about these injustices, vowing to never repeat them, and acting to right these wrongs, we can begin to heal together. When they came to this land, European co colonists brought with them their foreign standards about good and bad, about acceptable and unacceptable behavior, about appropriate and inappropriate partners. They brought with them rigid gender norms, norms that led to homophobia and transphobia. These norms med led to the near destruction of LGBTQ identities and two-spirit Indigenous identities. People whose identity had once been venerated were now filled with shame because of the people that they were. They were rejected and subjected to violence. And discrimination against LGBTQ2 communities was quickly codified in criminal offenses like buggery gross indecency, and body house provisions. Bathhouses were raided. People were entrapped by police. Our laws bolstered and emboldened those who wanted to attack non-conforming sexual desire. Our laws made private and consensual sex between same-sex partners a criminal offence, leading to the unjust arrest, conviction, and imprisonment of Canadians. This criminalization would have lasting impacts for things like employment, volunteering, and travel. Those arrested and charged were purposefully and vindictively shamed. Their names appeared in newspapers in order to humiliate them and their families. Lives were destroyed Tragically, lives were lost. Ces pratiques n'ont pas. These practices didn't end in 1969 when homosexual relationships were partly decriminalized. As late as 1988, a 20 year old gay man who had a sexual relationship with another man could still be convicted 
for what was still considered a crime. But it wasn't just imprisonment and criminalization that LGBTQ2 people had to worry about. Other methods of oppression were used in our society and have been for generations. Homophobia at the time of the AIDS crisis led to hysteria and fear of gay men. Books and magazines were seized at the border because they supposedly violated obscenity laws and customs regulations. The content of the text and images was judged unacceptable. LGBTQ2 families had to fight their own government for the right to social benefits and the right to marry, often at a high personal cost. Over our history, laws, policies, enacted by the government led to the legitimization of much more than inequality. They legitimized hatred and violence and brought shame to those targeted. While we may view modern Canada as a forward-thinking, progressive nation, we can't forget our past. The state orchestrated a culture of stigma and fear around LGBTQ2 communities, and in doing so, destroyed people's lives. Mr. Speaker, a purge that lasted decades will forever remain a tragic act of discrimination suffered by Canadian citizens at the hands of their own government. From the 1950s to the early 1990s, the Government of Canada exercised its authority in a cruel and unjust manner, undertaking a campaign of oppression against members and suspected members of the LGBTQ2 community. The goal was to identify these workers throughout the public service, including the Foreign Service, the military and the RCMP, and persecute them. You see, the thinking of the day was that all non-heterosexual Canadians would automatically be at increased risk of blackmail by our adversaries due to what was called character weakness. This thinking was prejudiced and flawed. And sadly, what resulted was nothing short of a witch hunt. The public service, the military, and the RCMP spied on their own people inside and outside of workplaces. During this time, the federal government even dedicated funding to an absurd device known as the fruit machine, a failed technology that was supposed to measure homosexual attraction. Canadians were monitored for anything that could be construed as homosexual behavior, with community groups, bars, parks, and even people's homes under constant watch. When the government felt that enough evidence had accumulated, some suspects were taken to secret locations in the dark of night to be interrogated. They were asked invasive questions about their relationships and sexual preferences. Hooked up to polygraph machines, these law-abiding public servants had the most intimate details of their lives cut open. Women and men were abused by their superiors and asked demeaning, probing questions about their sex lives. Some were sexually assaulted. Those who admitted they were gay were fired, discharged, or intimidated into resignation. They lost dignity, lost careers, and had their dreams and indeed their lives shattered. Many were submitted to blackmail in an attempt to get them to call out their peers. They were forced to betray their friends and their colleagues. Some promised to end their relationships if they could keep their jobs. Forced to live in the shadows they lost their partners, 
their friends, and their dignity. Those who did not lose their jobs were often demoted, stripped of their security clearance, and not considered for the promotions that they deserved. Under the harsh glare of the spotlight, people were forced to make an impossible choice, their career or their identity. And the very thing Canadian officials feared, blackmail of LGBTQ2 employees was happening. But it wasn't at the hand of our adversaries. It was at the hands of our own government. Mr. Speaker, the number one job of any government is to keep its citizens safe. And on this, we have failed LGBTQ2 communities and individuals time and time again. It is with shame and sorrow and deep regret for the things we have done that I stand here today and say we were wrong, we apologize, I am sorry, we are sorry. state-sponsored systemic oppression and rejection, we are sorry. For suppressing two-spirit Indigenous values and beliefs, we are sorry. For abusing the power of the law and making criminals of citizens, we are sorry. For, la censure du... for the government's censure, and for its repeated attempts to stop you from building your communities, for denying you your equality and forcing you to fight for that equality every day, often paying a high price to do so, for forcing you to live on the margins, for making you invisible, and for hum humiliating you, we are deeply sorry. We were wrong. To all the LGBTQ2 people across this country who we have harmed in countless ways, we are sorry. To those who were left broken by a prejudiced system and to those who took their own lives, we have failed you. For stripping you of your dignity, for robbing you of your potential, for treating you like you were dangerous, indecent, and flawed, we are sorry. To the victims of the purge who were surveilled, interrogated, and abused, who were forced to turn on their friends and colleagues who lost wages, lost health, and lost loved ones, we betrayed you. And we are so sorry. To those who were fired, to those who resigned, to those who stayed at a great personal and professional cost, to those who wanted to serve but never got the chance because of who you are. You should have been permitted to serve your country, and you were stripped of that option. We are sorry. We were wrong. 
Indeed, all Canadians missed out on important contributions you could have, would have made to our society. You were not bad soldiers, sailors, airmen and women. You were not predators, and you were not criminals. You served your country with integrity and courage. You are professionals. You are patriots. And above all, you are innocent. And for all your suffering, you deserve justice. And you deserve peace. It is our collective shame that you were so mistreated. And it is our collective shame that this apology took so long. Many who suffered are no longer alive to hear these words. And for that, we are truly sorry. To the partners, families, and friends of the people we harmed for upending your lives and for causing you such irreparable pain and grief, we are sorry. En présentant ces excuses pour nos erreurs, as we apologize for these painful mistakes, we must also thank those who spoke out. To those who resisted when it was unfashionable and even dangerous to do so. To those from all across the country, from all backgrounds and political stripes, we admire your courage and we thank you. Also thank members of the We Demand an Apology Network, our LGBTQ2 Apology Advisory Council, and the Just Society Committee for EGAL, as well as the individuals who have long advocated for this overdue apology. Thanks to them, we understood that we couldn't simply turn the page on this chapter in our history. We would be doing a disservice to the community and to all Canadians by wiping out this sad story. We will work together with the academic community and stakeholders to ensure that this history is publicly known and accessible. Remember, and we will remember. We will honour and memorialise the legacy of those who fought before us in the face of unbearable hatred and danger. Mr. Speaker, it is my hope that we will look back on today as a turning point. But there is still much more work to do ahead of us. Discrimination against LGBTQ2 communities is not a moment in time, but an ongoing centuries-old campaign. We want to be a partner and ally to LGBTQ2 Canadians in the years going forward. There are still real struggles facing these communities, including for those who are intersex, queer people of colour, and others who suffer from intersectional discrimination. Transgender Canadians are subjected to discrimination, violence and aggression at alarming rates. In fact, trans people didn't even have explicit protection under federal human rights legislation until this year. Mental health problems and suicide are more prevalent among young people in the LGBTQ community because of the discrimination and harassment they face. The homelessness rate among these young people is staggering. Work remains to be done on giving blood, organ donations, and the criminalization of not disclosing, disclosing HIV. The government must continue to work with its partners to improve policies and programs. Having said that, important, significant changes 
are in the works. Section 159 of the Criminal Code is on the road to being repealed in this House. I'm proud to say that earlier today in this House, we tabled the Expungement of Historically Unjust Convictions Act. This will mean that Canadians previously convicted of consensual sexual activity with same-sex partners will have their criminal records permanently destroyed. Further, I am pleased to announce that over the course of the weekend, we reached an agreement in principle with those involved in the class action lawsuit for actions related to the purge. Never again Will Canada's government be the source of so much pain for members of the LGBTQ2 communities? We promise to consult and work with individuals and communities to right these wrongs and begin to rebuild trust. We will ensure that there are systems in place so that these kinds of hateful practices are a thing of the past. Discrimination and oppression of LGBTQ2 Canadians will not be tolerated anymore. Thanks to dialogue and better mutual understanding, we will move forward together. But we won't achieve this on our own. Changing hearts and minds requires a collective effort. We will have to work together at all levels of government, with the LGBTQ community and Indigenous peoples to achieve the significant progress that LGBTQ2 Canadians deserve. Canada's history is far from perfect, but we believe in acknowledging and righting past wrongs so that we can learn from them. For all our differences, for all our diversity, we can find love and support in our common humanity. We're Canadians, and we want the very best for each other, regardless of our sexual orientation or our gender, identity, or expression. We will support one another in our fight for equality, and Canada will stand tall on the international stage as we proudly advocate for equal rights for LGBTQ2 communities around the world. <laughs> to the kids, who are listening at home and who fear rejection because of their sexual orientation or their gender identity and expression, and to those who are nervous and scared but also excited about what their future might hold, we are all worthy of love and deserving of respect. And whether you discover your truth at six, at sixteen, or at 60, who you are is valid. To members of the LGBTQ2 communities, young and old, here in Canada and around the world, you are loved and we support you. Le Canada, le Can Canada becomes a bit stronger each time we choose to welcome and celebrate who we are in all our diversity. We are a country of diversity. We are a richer country thanks to the lives, experiences, and contributions of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer, and two-spirit people. Who have lived and struggled, and to those who have fought so hard 
to get us to this place. Thank you for your courage and thank you for lending your voices. I hope and I know that you look back on all you have done with pride. because of your courage that we are here today together reminding ourselves and each other that we can and must do better. For the oppression of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer and two-spirit communities, we apologize. On behalf of the government, parliament and the people of Canada, we were wrong, we are sorry, and we will never let this happen again. Merci, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to join my colleagues in this House to reflect on a terrible and unjust moment in the history of the Federal Government of Canada. It's our responsibility as parliamentarians to defend the fundamental rights and freedoms of all Canadians. Rights is that of equal treatment before and under the law without unjust discrimination and to be free of any cruel or unusual treatment or punishment. And we are here today because many years ago and for too long, the Government of Canada failed in its duty to protect the basic rights of hundreds, thousands, the very Canadians who had dedicated their lives to public service. Say femme et say homme. These men these women, our fellow citizens, lost their jobs because they were suspected of being gay. Well, Mr. Speaker, Canadians can perhaps picture what losing your livelihood can do to your self-esteem, to your family, and to your own quality of life. Mais ça n'est, ça n'est rien. But that's nothing compared to the fear and intimidation that many of these men and women faced with their own government, the institutions they'd served so altruistically. In its history, the Government of Canada perpetuated this injustice. It took a, upon itself the mantle of judge, jury, and set the private lives of its citizens in its sights. Too often, and in too many cases around the world, we have seen the terrible consequences of overreaching governments. We must have an honest discussion with people who were subject to this terrible campaign designed to expose and humiliate LGBTQ2 people in the public service. In this country, we deplore and we condemn injustice towards the innocent, the oppressed, and the persecuted. And harassment based on fear is its own injustice. And, Mr. Speaker, we must not fail to mention the toll this campaign of intimidation took on the brave women and men in uniform who found themselves the target of their superiors. 
pour ceux qui défendent notre pays. For those who defend our country, the government's accusations about their personal lives were made even more offensive by the insinuation that they were acting against the interests of the country, the same one that they were dedicating themselves to. This type of insult is difficult to imagine and impossible to measure. Men and women who dedicate themselves to the defense of Canadian men and women throughout the country and abroad were targeted by a secret process, arrests and recriminations, embarrassed before their families, their friends and their colleagues. Lives were stopped. They were unable to earn a living. I firmly believe that we need to recognize that this country is improving. To ensure Canada remains a champion of justice, human rights and liberty. All of us here continually strive to be better as elected officials, as a people, and as a country. Monsieur le Président, les conservateurs croient profondément. Mr. Speaker, conservatives firmly believe in these principles. All human beings have the same value and dignity, deserve the same respect, and men and women who have different perspectives can grant each other mutual respect as human beings. The dignity or freedom of those citizens that seek to make Canada a better place. How you treat your fellow Canadians, how you work every single day to make this country stronger, how you give of yourself to your families, to your communities, and to your loved ones. Those are the true measures of one's love for Canada. Les excuses d'aujourd'hui doivent être une... Today's apology must be an opportunity for all of us to recommit to defending human rights, not only here in this country, but throughout the entire world. There are too many countries who today are passing policies that officialize the harassment of gays and lesbians. Too often the consequences are not only being fired and public shaming, but torture and death. Canada is better than that. We must do more to stand up for the LGBTQ2 community in places like Iran and Russia and other countries where they are the target of brutal violence. And I am personally proud of the work done by the previous government to prioritize these and other refugee groups who are particularly vulnerable. Nous avons tout le devoir ici aujourd'hui Today, we all have the duty to ensure that Canada is better for everyone, regardless of who you are, and for those who had to leave careers that they had invested years into building, and all those who were rejected without being able to speak up, we hope that today's apology offers a certain justice. Not undo the wrongdoing and pain they have endured, but it is another important step toward leaving the next generation a parliament that more fully embraces its duty to protect the rights and freedoms of every person it was built to serve. Thank you. Sir. The Honourable Member for Rimouski and Nejat et Les Basques. New Democrats welcome and support today's apology. We join the government in acknowledging the harm that was done to the entire LGBTQ community, but especially the severe impacts that prejudice, discrimination, and persecution have had on individuals. We also want to honour today those many activists who resisted these campaigns and fought back against social prejudice. Today is a vindication of your struggles. Il est plus que temps de reconnaître que la
It is more than time to recognize that the careers and lives of thousands of Canadians were ruined, not only by discrimination, homophobia, and transphobia that were endemic in the past, but also by government policies and campaigns that singled out members of the LGBTQ community in order to persecute them. It could take many forms. There were many criminal prosecutions for consensual homosexual activity. Special units were set up in the Canadian forces to identify gay and lesbian members and to push them to leave the forces, either by forcing them to resign or by offering honorable discharge for their cooperation or by imposing those who were being tracked down various forms of mentions that were less than honorable. There was even a secret committee of officials and RCMP officers set up in Ottawa that met sometimes weekly in order to lead a campaign to fire them from the public service in the RCMP. Despite the fact that consensual same-sex activity had been legalized in 1969 with the support of both Liberals and the NDP, these government activities targeting the LGBTQ community continued well into the 90s. Anyone who doubts the relentlessness of these campaigns, I have only to read Gary Kinsman's book, The Canadian War on Queers, for the proof that these campaigns had devastating consequences. Careers cut, cut short. Family and social lives ruined because of the impacts of being outed as a result of the firings or arrests. <clears throat> but as time went on, members of the LGBTQ community began to resist. Long-serving New Democrat Member of Parliament Sven Robinson worked tirelessly for change as the first and for many years the only openly gay Member of Parliament in the House of Commons. issues he tackled, perhaps most significant was his success in having sexual orientation added to the hate crimes section of the criminal code in a private member's bill that became law in 2004. Let's also remember that James Egan and John Nesbitt fought in the courts for recognition of equal spousal pension rights and won when sexual orientation was added to the, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms as a prohibited ground for discrimination by the Supreme Court in 1995. Some 25 years ago in this October, a very brave member of the Canadian Forces, Michelle Douglas, challenged her dismissal from the Forces in court and won a judgment outlawing dismissals from the Canadian Forces on the basis of sexual orientation. This apology, nearly 25 years after the end of the discharges from the military and firings from the public service, and 50 years after the legalization of same-sex activity, comes none too soon for those who were its victims. Even simply the idea of an apology has been on the agenda for a very long time. Longtime NDP member Libby Davies, the first openly lesbian woman in this House, tabled a motion over three years ago calling for a meaningful apology for those fired from the public service. <laughs> Today we should also acknowledge the work of those who helped make this apology possible, especially the Advisory Council who worked with the government to get this apology before us today as well as the activists from We Demand an Apology Network and EGAL's Just Society Committee, who not only made the case for justice, but kept up the pressure on government to act. <laughs> the 
Most of all, we should thank those survivors of the anti-LGBTQ campaigns who have come forward to tell their heart-wrenching stories yet one more time. A And yes, the apology is, in and of itself, a form of justice. New Democrats are happy that they were offered today by the Prime Minister and that they are going to be put on the House of Commons record. And yes, the New Democrats were concerned that there would be an apology today without reference to compensation. We were pleased to see that the government acted in the last few days to include measures that would start to deal with the substance of the damage for which the apology is being offered. The New Democrats commit today to working in cooperation with the government to ensure that the legislative measures are passed quickly by the House and that they be complete. We also commit to continuing to work with the LGBTQ community to ensure that legislative changes become a daily reality because there remains much to be done when it comes to justice for the LGBTQ community. We hope that today represents a real change of pace for the government when it comes to LGBTQ issues and that it implements a, a renewed climate of cooperation on these issues in Parliament. New Democrats are also pleased to hear that the government has reached an agreement in principle with the plaintiffs in the class action lawsuit against the government. This lawsuit sought restitution for a specific harms to individuals resulting from the government's campaign of firings from the public service, the RCMP, and the Canadian forces. While the damage suffered was never just limited to financial losses, just compensation is an important part of any effort at restorative justice. We acknowledge the openness that the Minister of Justice showed in working with the member from Esquimalt Saanich Sook on passing his former private member's bill as a government bill. Yeah, yeah. Yet there is still much to do in order to change government policies and practices so they honor the new legislated right to be free from discrimination on the basis of gender identity or expression. Let's get to work, starting today with transgender and gender variant Canadians implementing Bill C-16. When it comes to ending legal discrimination against the LGBTQ community, there is no doubt as to what must be done. We are pleased to see the tabling of a bill that intends to expunge the records of gay men who participated in consensual homosexual activity. But it's not as though we did not know what such a bill could look like. Philip Toon, a new Democrat from Quebec during the last Parliament, presented such measures in 2014 as a private member's bill. Similar measures were also tabled on the same day as an apology by the Australian state of Queensland in New Zealand. These measures against this injustice should have been introduced decades ago. This bill is more than symbolic. Gay men with unjust criminal records have to deal every day with bans from traveling, from volunteering, and they even face discrimination when it comes to getting a job. Here we hope to see authorization to proceed on addressing the cases of those kicked out of the Canadian forces with something less than fully honourable discharges. <laughs> After all, more than a year ago, the National Defence Committee unanimously approved a motion from the member from Esquimalt Sanich Suk, calling on the Minister of Defence to authorise the military ombudsman to begin revising service records of those who were driven out of the Canadian forces based on who they loved. We understand that aspects of dismissals from the forces will be covered in the settlement of the class action lawsuit, but the revision of service records still need to happen. 
the New Democrats welcome the promise of the government to go forward with repealing Section 159 of the Criminal Code, a section which sets out a different age of consent for anal intercourse compared to heterosexual relations. Although the government tabled a bill, it has remained blocked at a first reading stage for months. And yet, such a bill had already been tabled in the House during the last Parliament in 2014 by former New Democrat MP Craig Scott. There is, of course, one sense in which this apology risks ringing hollow. That will be if this Parliament fails to act expeditiously to end discriminatory laws and policies that continue to penalize and stigmatize the LGBTQ community. As some have said, this would be a good time to stop doing things the government might have to apologize for in the future. <laughs> the discriminatory gay blood ban remains in place, despite the fact that almost every health professional agrees that no science behind the fact. Mr. Speaker, a policy which not only stigmatizes gay men, but also continues to restrict the supply of blood and organs at a time when the need is so great. Monsieur le Président, les ma Mr. Speaker, members of the LGBTQ community waited for decades for our government to recognize the systemic nature of injustices committed against their community. Today is therefore a significant day, marked by apologies presented on behalf of all Canadians and by the government's commitment to start to repair these harms. What we recognize today is that the injustices committed against gay, lesbian, bisexual and transgender Canadians were both blatant and systemic from the government. But New Democrats hope that today will mark more than simply turning the page on this regrettable part of our history. Instead, this apology should be the springboard for action both here in Parliament and in Canadian society. We must begin by removing the last vestiges of institutional discrimination against lesbian, gay, bisexual, intersex, and transgender Canadians. But we must also eradicate the prejudice that lives in our communities and affects our siblings, our children, parents, friends, and neighbors. From Sven Robinson to Libby Davies to the members from Esquimalt, Saanich, Sook, and Saskatoon West, and so many more, the NDP consistently stood with the LGBTQ community and followed their lead on these vital civil rights issues. It is our hope, Mr. Speaker, that all Canadians take today as an opportunity to move forward and continue to build the inclusive, accepting country that we all know we can be. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Repentigny. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We look back today on a dark chapter of Canada's history. This is an opportunity to remember just how far we have come in fighting discrimination based on sexual orientation, just how, how far. Until 1992, discrimination against lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and two-spirited people among employees of the Canadian state was not only something that existed, not only was it tolerated, this discrimination was an official policy. Until 1992, discrimination based on sexual orientation was considered a reason of state. Canada violated human rights under the pretext of greater interests and security. They were not content with denying the rights of LGBTQ2 people. 
they were not content to insult them, to treat them like a threat to their country. The federal government set up investigative units to serve the purposes of discrimination. It even created a tool to help it determine the sexual orientation of individuals, a tool whose name I prefer not to mention as it is so deeply insulting. Canada hunted these individuals with the goal of dismissing them in disgrace as though they were criminals and they are still suffering from those consequences today. This was systemic discrimination against LGBTQ2 people. They used every policy to impose these values. This didn't happen in the Middle Age, Mr. Speaker. It happened right up until 1992. The apologies made today by the government are essential, and the Bloc Québécois fully supports them. We expect that the apology will include fair and equitable compensation for the victims of this systemic discrimination. It is absolutely essential that the Canadian government send a strong message and that Parliament as a whole send a strong message. To the LGBTQ2 community, we say that we are proud to include you among our family as our friends, colleagues, business owners, artists, scientists, successors, retirees, and yes, our soldiers, our public servants, and members of our society. It is essential to send a strong message because even though there has been progress in the fight against discrimination since 1992, this progress stands on fragile ground. The fight for equality will never be fully won. When you're a woman, you know something about that, Mr. Speaker. We should never lose sight of the fact that we are not immune to setbacks. And when you're a woman, you know something about that too. It's essential to send a strong message as parliamentarians, because all around the world, there are rumblings of intolerance that we need to fight together. Facing an extreme right wing that is ever more present and ever closer to power and ever closer to home, we must present ourselves as clear allies uh, fighting for equality for all. Facing gr the growing influence of dogmatic religious movements in state affairs, we must st stand clearly as allies in the fight for equality for all. Without compromise, we must fight determinedly for equality for all. If there is one principle that we are all ready to defend, it is the importance of our freedom to be, our freedom to live, our freedom to love anyone, regardless of who we are. These apologies should be an opportunity for us to reflect, and these apologies should also be a strong and determined statement that the time for discrimination against lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and bi, uh, and two-spirited people, that the time for that discrimination is over, period. The Honourable Member for Senate Gulf Islands. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. What an excellent speech from my friend, the Member for La Pantigny, and all of the other party leaders here in the House today. It's an honour for me as well to speak today and to thank our Prime Minister again for the official apologies that were made. It's been a long time coming, but the day is finally here and we've had official, uh, sincere apologies. Prime Minister, the Government of Canada, Member of Parliament for Edmonton Centre, Member of Parliament for Esquimalt, Saanich Souk, and all those who've gone before, like Libby Davies, like Sven Robinson, all of those in this place who've recognized that there has been a historic injustice and one that touched all aspects of the lives of our friends, brothers, sisters, parents, cousins, Throughout this society, people have suffered. The trailblazers, and we know them, 
those who first achieved equal marriage, the first couple, same-sex couple to marry in British Columbia, my friends Tom Graff and Anthony Porcino, my friends and constituents Robin Roberts and Diana Denny, who their fight was so deeply personal, so difficult to be told they can't marry, raise their children together. But today's apology focuses on something in some ways even more brutal, no less personal, but to drum people out of the jobs they've earned because of their partners, because of the people they love. And in that, I want to specifically recognize I'm so honored that two of my constituents here for this apology, Emma Smith and Mary Lou Williams, who were fine soldiers until the military discovered that they loved each other. They ended up in military prison. I mean, uh, anyone knows how hard it is to go through that decision, how do I tell my parents? The last thing you imagine is that the military police are going to tell them for you. They are brave, and they also, as all I think many in this room recognize, we acknowledge and thank the We Demand an Apology Network, without which I don't think many of these people who have gone through years of feeling shame, of feeling isolated, of thinking it was only them. And anyone who served with Emma would tell you that she was the best soldier in that platoon. So Canada not only punished and shamed and ostracized and violated the civil rights, the human rights of Canadians, we also deprived ourselves of excellent soldiers terrific members of the RCMP, people who would have been wonderful diplomats in our foreign service. Our stupidity and blindness and ignorance punished our society while bringing grievous injustice and long-lasting pain to people who had done nothing wrong but want to serve their country. And this apology matters. I think there are cynics among us who will say at one point that surely Canada's government has apologized enough. We apologize for residential schools. We apologize for the Kamagatu Maru. We apologize, we probably will still apologize for turning the St. Louis around in Halifax Harbor. We apologize now to the LGBTQ community. And somehow, someone might think, do apologies matter? I just want to say clearly, I know they matter. They matter to the people who've suffered injustice. They matter to the families of those who've died, who never got to hear this apology. They matter to all Canadians to know that we recognize that we have wronged our fellow citizens, that we will never do it again. fellow friends. That's terribly kind. I just, we've been here a while and this is an emotional thing. But I think it needs to be said that this is a wonderful moment for all those who are oppressed. Wherever you are, whatever the reason, and I do think transgendered people, boy, do they need our support now. I lost a friend just in October. Dr. Susan Roddy took her own life, a wonderful mathematics professor at University of Brandon, Manitoba was still suffering discrimination and injustice as a trans woman. We're not there yet. We have not righted all the wrongs. We have not eliminated all the discrimination. But we stand here today, and the quote that comes to mind from a speech from Martin Luther King, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Thank you. Speaker, as a member of Parliament and as a Canadian citizen, I am honoured to have been in this chamber to hear the powerful words spoken over the past hour by my honourable colleagues. To those, those whom we have wronged, those to whom we have caused great suffering, 
whether by commission or omission, do not owe us their forgiveness. Acknowledging our nation's past injustices does not wipe the slate clean. But I would hope that the LGBTQ2 community will recognize in the words that were spoken in this House today that we are expressing sincere regret for the great wrong committed against it and that together we will move forward to shape an ever fairer society. Orders of the day. Government orders, government bills, comments, resuming debate on